It was a brisk morning in Candlekeep. The wind was blowing in off the choppy sea of swords. The cry of seagulls woke me as they headed inland, chased off the ocean by another storm coming in. Winter was coming, and I had just got back from my long journey. I heard a scratching sound on the sturdy oak storm shutters outside my window. I knew who it was, and jumped out of bed, dodging my travel gear and backpack, my bare feet padding across paper-strewn castle flagstone floors with threadbare rugs piled on one another. It was a bit dark, but I could see well enough thanks to my mother's side of the family. I lifted latches and opened the glass pane windows, and then pulled the pegs and carefully pushed open the oak shutters. Stepping back as a scarlet-scaled, bat-winged mongoose leapt past me and landed, like a cat, on my dusty desk. Spun a couple of times to get a good look at the state of my chambers, and then sat down, long tail wrapped around taloned toes, head tilted in a way that those familiar with a pseudo-dragon know to mean, welcome home, tell me everything. I had sorely missed my friend, but yes... I do know pseudo dragons very well, so I hurried to close the window, made a show of shivering from the cold and went to stoke the fireplace embers back to life with a fresh log of blue wood. It sparked with a lovely aroma in those exotic blue flames. I had a large basket of the leaves, gleaming blue, dry, many pointed, and a pail of freshly drawn water beside the hearth, next to a bucket of coal. Once satisfied that the fire was in good order, I went to my backpack and took out several of my travel journals and heard a delighted coo come from my desk. Oh, Mac, you won't believe what I have seen. Shall we get to work? I felt that familiar, peculiar sensation of Mac Rotaxel's telepathic link. It's hard to describe the images and imagination provoked in the mind's eye by the use of language, bypassing the words and skipping right to the images and emotions of the meaning. And that was what I got from the pseudo-dragon. An image of me comfortable in my chair, munching on a crackle bun, staring out the window, a half-page illustration, the ink drying on the desk before me, then an alert, a weird sensation of a rank smell and a scurrying form of a rat, and then an impression of a whole lot of rats nestled in a chewed-up book pages, and then a feeling like warm amusement and that comfortable feeling of a long friendship. This was Mac saying, if I may put it into words of our conversation, it would sound like this. You call this work? Sitting in a warm tower and drawing word pictures all day? By the way, you have a rat in here. I can smell it. Probably a whole family. But do get comfortable. It's nice to have you back home safe and sound again. You really should come with me next time, next season. I have all that I need right here in the bluff. Thank you very much. And with that, he pounced on the floor and jabbed his tail behind the nearest bookshelf with lightning speed and accuracy. And with a squeak, the first of an unreasonable number of rats met a swift demise. Just as well. I didn't have any of leftover crab cakes for Mac's breakfast, and he was quite happy to eat a nice, fat, fresh rodent. I do wish he spared me the sensations, but you do tend to get used to a bit of oversharing telepathy where pseudo dragons are concerned. Hello, my name is AJ Pickett, and I make videos about role playing games, particularly the rich lore of current and older editions of Dungeons and Dragons, monster ecologies, world settings, mostly the Forgotten Realms, but I dabble in all sorts of role-playing games, cosmology and literature. I have lots of videos for you to binge watch, and I upload every week. Pseudo dragons are small. They really grow larger than three feet long. About two feet of that length is their tail. They resemble miniature dragons, and while they do have a tail stinger, they are not closely related to wyverns. Nor are they a member of the Drake family. They are true lesser dragons, all seven to nine pounds of them. On average, they are a bit smaller than your average house cat and have a red-brown hide covered in fine scales with sharp little horns and spines growing from the head and down the backbone, dark as cast iron. Their fangs are ivory white and they have bright yellow eyes. If you do happen to find a pseudo dragon that has different coloration, that's not a different breed. It's either a special mutation, an illusion, a permanently altered appearance thanks to spell magic, or some effect due to exposure to wild magic. Otherwise, pseudo dragons all tend to look like tiny red dragons, with four limbs, two bat-like wings, and a flexible neck and a long head and snout. Red dragons are completely different body shape when they are very small though, and I don't think they are as small as a pseudo dragon even when they first hatch. 
Some folks do call the pseudo dragon a drake. They, well, there are a lot of different names for them. They may call themselves the Koz, depending where you go. They can be found all over Faerun, surviving quite well in a wide variety of climates and landscapes. They're fairly elusive in the wild though and tend to dwell in safe spots with comfortable conditions for a small predator, often making a little nest for itself in a tree hollow, cave, roof awning, ruin or some such. In terms of game attribute stats, they are exactly the same as they were in 3.5 edition's core monster manual. They have a strength of 6, a dexterity of 15, they are very agile and fast in the air, covering 60 feet per round without dashing. On the ground they're a lot slower, moving only 15 feet per round and they do tend to jump and glide rather than sprint on their feet. They have a constitution of 13 and are hardy despite their love of comfort. They have a natural armor class of 13 and 2d4 plus 2 or between 4 and 10 with an average of 7 hit points. Even though they're well known for their poison stinger, they don't have any particular resistance to poison themselves. And they do have a natural resistance to magic though, providing them with advantage on any saving throws against spells and other magical effects no matter what the spell or effects level is. This is about the closest indicator that they are indeed a draconic life form, along with their intelligence and certain personality traits, which I'll talk about in a minute. They are carnivores. They prefer to hunt insects, rodents, small birds, most snakes and lizards, frogs, fish, crustaceans, the occasional egg, as well as cheese, butter, bacon rinds, and pretty much most of the cooked meats that humanoids eat. They can, but normally they don't eat fruit, vegetables, or grains of any kind. They also dislike anything sweet, pickled, or too overcooked. Oh, and they typically dislike blue cheese and yogurt. They don't drink milk, but they don't mind cream. Also, they may or may not eat any particular insect or egg. As far as I know, this is not them being fussy, although they can be fussy. It's just that they have a range of tastes for their kind of food that humanoids just don't understand. Some cockroaches are disgusting, some are delicious apparently. Pseudo dragons do have very fine visual, auditory and olfactory senses. They have advantage on wisdom perception checks that rely on sight, hearing or smell. They're also plus three to their perception skill rolls as well as adding their plus two proficiency bonus. They also add that bonus onto their stealth skill checks, which are already plus four. Some people swear that pseudo dragons are capable of some sort of magical chameleon ability, changing appearance with an illusion to blend in with the environment, but this is not true exactly. They can blend into forest or desert thanks to their skin. It has several layers that have special cells called chromatophores, so they're actually true chameleons. The pseudo dragon's outer skin consists of many tiny translucent scales made of keratin, which is what our nails and hair is made from, and beneath that, layers of skin contain fixed blobs of reddish brown colour and free-floating blobs of a darker substance called melanin. Nerve impulses cause the free-floating blobs to shift position within the multiple layers, which changes the observed colour to greens, reds, browns, or even black, and any sort of pattern. This provides the skill bonus to stealth you see in the stat block in the Pseudo Dragon in 5th edition, but they don't explain why, unfortunately. Thankfully, I have the ecology of the Pseudo Dragon from Dragon Magazine number 269, which is quite clear on that subject, but it's a bit dated on other subjects regarding Pseudo Dragons. The personality of pseudo dragons is often described as cat-like. They're proud and self-absorbed most of the time. They can be a bit arrogant and demanding. They are very fond of attention and affection from those they've developed a special bond with. They are great judges of character thanks to their intelligence and their telepathic ability. They choose who they are friends with and are often sneaky, sarcastic and very funny. They don't play pranks that will cause their friends any harm and while they do tend to demand a lot of attention creature comforts, food and treats, particularly shiny trinkets that they can keep around their nest, they resent and quickly correct anybody who thinks or says that they are pets. They also do not tolerate being belittled, mistreated or ignored and will quickly abandon anyone who behaves that way towards them. They can answer the call of the find familiar spell, this is true, but they also tend to seek out the companionship of good-natured, intelligent humanoids. And it is for this reason that their draconic name, the name other dragons, and they themselves call them, is Levithix Derastrix. Translated, this literally means wizard dragon. 
There's a little irony in the name, since pseudo dragons not only don't have innate magical powers, they're simply not inclined to ever learn how to cast spells, and they have no patience for it at all. The reasons why they sometimes seek out humanoid company, and most often good natured wizards, scholars, and sages, is because we tend to collect a lot of books and things, and we tend to keep warm and dry and leave plates of food lying around and well. We attract a lot of vermin, which the pseudo dragons like to chase and eat. We also have lots of nice spots to rest, we keep a pretty secure lair for ourselves, and we make for entertaining company. A pseudo dragon is not a pet, it's sharing a lair, and like any reasonable arrangement, there are certain ground rules regarding shared spaces, private spaces, and good considerate habits. Pseudo dragons do have a number of cat-like habits. They will demand food, and every so often they will bring food to their companion. They know damn well that we don't eat dead rats. Well, certainly I don't. Well, never saying I never have. I'm, I'm eating Luskin street food after all. A pseudo dragon enjoys praise, so they'll bring you delicacies. Maxotraxel brings me fresh oysters, both because I am very good at shucking oysters out of their shell and because it's a meal that we both absolutely love. There are plenty of oysters growing on the rocky sea cliffs around Candlekeep and I'm honestly mystified as to how Mac gets the oysters off the rocks. There's an unspoken arrangement, an agreement, that um, I'm never to investigate and find out how he does it. Because he enjoys knowing something I don't know and being the only one who can bring me fresh oysters. He also has a quite valuable collection of pearls. Another reason Mac lives in my chambers is because, much like me, he hibernates over the cold winter months, during which time he can be amazingly lazy and happily eats tons of crab cakes, which Candlekeep does particularly well. Pseudo dragons live for about 10 to 15 years in the wild. Those who keep company with humanoids can live up to 25 years or so if they watch their diet in later years. They are mostly solitary but gather together in the springtime for mating season. The males are particularly aggressive during that gathering time and it's generally a good idea to steer well clear of the area that they're mating in or risk a three day long quite unpleasant catatonic nap with dozens of stings. And some humiliation, but more on that in a moment. The gathering parts company after mating, the females lay two to five eggs the same size and weight as those of chickens, but leathery and brown spotted. They hatch after about a week or two and grow quickly into their first year of life, reaching adult size by around 14 months depending on diet. In places where the pseudo dragons are not as densely populated, they form a parent bond and the male and female raise the offspring together. This grouping is called a clutch of pseudo dragons. An infant pseudo dragon is called a hatchling and in the first year of life they are known as a whelp. Whelps don't have fully functional tail stingers until they reach adult size. I am sorry to say that a viable pseudo dragon egg can fetch a price of up to 10,000 gold in some human marketplaces, and a hatchling as much as 20,000 gold. Obviously this disreputable trade is cruel and harmful. Pseudo dragons hate cruelty, they will free other captive creatures when they can, and to be subject to it themselves is a miserable life. Most will be driven mad by it, as it's common practice to mutilate them by cutting off the tail stinger when they're hatched. They cut their wing membranes and muzzle them as adults. It says a lot about any person who would want to own a pseudo dragon that way. There are four types of vocal signals pseudo dragons use. The purr is, of course, a sign of pleasure. They purr when being groomed and when treated to gifts of shiny trinkets and food that they enjoy. Since they do shed their old scales and skin fairly frequently, they need a lot of grooming and care, as bits of old skin and scales are flaking off bit by bit. They don't shed all their old hide like a snake. They chirp when they want something, this could be used like a cat meow, or in the same way that cats make a funny chirping noise when they see a bird, it's like a chattering chirp. It's a sound of desire and anticipation. They do hiss in anger or fear, or as a threatening signal, it's a lot more throaty than a cat hiss, deep in their chest and through their long, flexible neck. They'll also growl, again deep in the chest, when they're very angry or warning off an intruder. Unlike cats, the tail up in the air is not a happy gesture for pseudo dragons. Their tail is a weapon. It's a good sign when their tail is relaxed, or better yet, coiled around closer to the body. Don't be fooled though, they also coil their tail before striking sometimes. If they have their head down low 
and their tail arched over their back between their wings, you had best back off immediately. If the growling and hissing is not clear enough, that's the clearest sign and warning that they'll give you before they strike. It's a courtesy. They can hit with that tail from any position at any time, from sound asleep on their back with their feet in the air to a dead rat skewered against a wall in the blink of an eye. 5th edition has a stat block for the pseudo dragon. It's a challenge rating 1 quarter. They are tiny, good natured, I would say borderline chaotic good, and not so good during the couple of weeks when spring fever hits them. They have blind sight out to 10 feet that allows them to detect their environment without use of their vision, thanks to their other heightened senses, which also provide them with advantage on wisdom uh, perception checks that rely on their hearing, sense of smell, and their sharp vision, as I mentioned. They are normally active only in the daytime. They still have 60 foot dark vision though. Their limited telepathic ability has a range of 100 feet and an increase from older editions of the game where it was only 60. They can send emotions, images and simple ideas to any creature that can understand a language. They can also establish a telepathic bond with one other willing companion as their familiar. While the two are bonded, the companion can sense what the pseudo dragon senses as long as they are within one mile of each other. While the pseudo dragon is within 10 feet of its companion, the companion shares the pseudo dragon's magic resistance trait. And any time and for any reason a pseudo dragon can end its service as a familiar ending the telepathic bond. As mentioned, they have a natural armor class of 13 and an average of 7 hit points. They can make use of magic items such as rings, necklaces wrapped around them, amulets strapped to their chest and such, which is not uncommon if they are the familiar of an adventurer. In combat, they rely on stealth and their flight speed. Although not represented well in the 5th edition stat block, traditionally their stealth skill increases from plus 4 to plus 8 in forests or other terrain where they can make use of their chameleon-like camouflage. Their sting attack is their main form of attack and defense, plus 4 to hit one creature within 5 feet inflicting 1d4 plus 2 piercing damage, and the target must succeed on a dc11 constitution saving throw or become poisoned for one hour. If the saving throw fails by 5 or more, the target falls unconscious for the same duration, or until it takes damage or another creature uses an action to shake it awake. Note that there is no saving throw for the victim while they are poisoned. The effect doesn't end suddenly if they take damage. That's only for the unconsciousness, so it's quite a nasty toxin. Let me tell you though, what 5th edition has left out. It's a paralytic poison that causes the body to stiffen and the joints to lock up. So a poisoned victim is kind of comically stilted and sounds like they're suffering from lockjaw, staggering around like they're drunk feeling lethargic and heavy. Their limbs tend to stay in whatever position they're moved to. When knocked out completely by this toxin, the stiffness is complete and a catatonic victim can be moved and stays in that position. The pseudo dragons take full advantage of this and arrange their victim into a hilarious pose, such as on their back with their hands and feet in the air like a dead insect, or in compromising and embarrassing positions, particularly if there's a group of victims. <clears throat> the duration of this catatonic poison used to be up to three days in older editions, resulting in victims waking up very hungry, thirsty, and with possible bed sores from staying in the same position for such a long time, completely vulnerable. Pseudo dragons can also deliver a bite attack if they have to, also plus 4 to hit one target within 5 feet inflicting 1d4 plus 2 piercing damage, and the bite is non-venomous, but people don't automatically know that, and the pseudo dragon is smart enough to emulate other venomous creatures, such as the venom spitting attack of a cobra right into the eyes of an enemy at close range. In the wild, pseudo dragons are elusive and reclusive. They stay out of sight and observe humanoids from a distance before deciding to engage with them or not, using telepathy to gauge uh, what sort of people they are. As mentioned, they prefer to nest in tree hollows, caves, or the occasional abandoned burrow. They don't dig burrows themselves. They certainly do hunt in them, eating rodents mostly, as well as rabbits, quail, pheasants, smaller birds, lizards, and so on. Farmers are generally delighted when they see signs of pseudo-dragons hunting in the area, unless they happen to breed hamsters or something, and then they lose quite a few chickens if they do manage to really annoy the pseudo-dragon, but otherwise, it's a mutual respect. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed this content. Likes appreciated, subscriptions adored. As always, happy to answer any questions and read anecdotes in the comments section down below. Share your tales and inspire others with your ideas and experience. Come and join the Discord community, it's a friendly place. As always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.
I know someone's going to ask me this, <laughs> and yes, as a draconic creature, albeit a lesser dragon, I see no reason why there could not be a pseudo dragon born. Lean, gnome sized, charismatic, playful, clever, well groomed, and snappy dresses with a taste for fine gems, and a sleek, expressive, and long tail equipped with a wicked barb and paralytic venom. Fond of drakes, fairy dragons, and pseudo dragons, not fond at all of imps and quasits. Typically good natured, a little irreverent and sarcastic, leaning heavily into bard or the rogue class most likely, very skilled with thrown and missile weapons, dexterity and light weapons over strength and heavy weapons, tend to feel the cold a bit more than other dragonborn, not inclined or very good at spellcasting, but still have that innate anti-magic advantage. Short, uh, well shorter lifespan, a solitary wanderlust, enjoy the company of humanoids with good hearts and brains in their head, make pranks, not war. What happens at spring break stays at spring break. <laughs>